And we're live. Welcome to another interview on HerViewPhotography.com. My name is Darlene. I am the host and um, owner of HerView Photography. And today I am quite honored to have two prestigious photographers, not one but two, um, in the area of wildlife, landscape, nature photography. And I've been following their work for a while and it's absolutely stunning. I'm sure you will agree once we get in to see some of their pictures. So I'd like to welcome Jay and Verena Patel. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for inviting us. Thanks for having us. So um, tell me a little bit about yourselves. I don't know much about you guys other than you guys have amazing, amazing work. Uh, how did you get into landscape photography and, and did you start doing this together or meet along the way? You want me to go first? All right, so um, let me start here. Um, I always wanted to do photography, but um, I grew up in India and we didn't have quite enough resources to do photography. So then I came to US to go to school and photography career was put on hold until digital cameras started to come into play and I started to read all about it and then finally decided that I have some extra money to spare and jumped in the game around 2000. And I purchased my first DSLR around 2001 and I've been doing photography since 2001. And we're not going to tell you how we met and when she started. So, um, yeah, I, I started when I was about 14 years old. I took my first photography class. My dad used to let me use his camera, and he was really great about, um, you know, getting the photos processed and, and giving me ideas for, for getting in close or, or, you know, just little tips for photography. Um, and uh, Jay and I met in what, 2006? <laughs> I should know that. Um, and uh, we, we, I guess 2005, yeah, yeah, at a photographic society meeting. And um, yeah, we, we, it was a critique. He critiqued one of my photos and he was nice about it. So here we are. <laughs> and, and as we say, the rest is history. That's right. <laughs> So I, I do a lot of classes and uh, I, I don't personally do a lot of nature work. Um, I tend to the more urban. So I'm interested in, you know, why did you guys pick landscape or nature? Like what drew you to that genre of photography? That's, that's, it's kind of a tough question, but I think for both of us, um, we have an intense love for nature. We want to be out there all the time. We want to be hiking. We want to be out in the woods. Um, we just love nature and there's nothing quite like being in the middle of nowhere where you can't hear planes flying overhead and, and there are no cars going by on the highway. You know, And so everything uh, that we're doing on a daily basis is sort of in an attempt to, to get back out to um, you know, a wild place. Uh, we both just love that. Yeah, and for me, it's like uh, I always liked hiking, backpacking, being outside. I rather run outside than be running on a treadmill. So for me, it was just an extension of what I really like. Um, to be honest with you, I never got into photography as part of a business. I got into photography to pursue my passion. And even today, we look at primarily as a photography as a passion for us. And so if we if we if we don't like doing something, we'll just drop it and not do it just because it makes money, we will not follow it. That's that's a fabulous philosophy of life in general. I tend to do the same thing myself. And um, one of the questions I had about your landscape stuff is, you know, how much of it is deep into the backcountry and, you know, you feel free to show us some examples while we're chatting, Jay, and look through some stuff, but how much is deep into the woods or somewhere off the roads versus, okay, somebody can just drive up and get out of the car and take the same picture. So that really depends upon the philosophy that you follow. For us, the philosophy is um, that we follow light. And if the light occurs at the side of the road, then we will follow the light at the side of the road. If the light occurs at back country, uh, we'll follow the light in the back country. So a lot of these photographs you see are either popular places or some are, you can only get to it by 10 miles hiking. So it isn't that we follow philosophy. Like for example, this particular photo, I, I took it with a champagne glass in my hand, right from the side of a boat. 
uh, just because it was fabulous. So, so for us, it isn't much about the location as much as it is about the light. And Marina? Yeah, we're always looking for that fantastic light, and it really doesn't matter what the light's falling on. Um, you know, we're we're certainly concerned about composition. Of course, we are, but but photography is about light every time. I couldn't agree more. And and you guys are masters of of seeing the light and knowing how to capture it. Thank um, you. Thanks. <laughs> Did either of you have, I, again, I get a lot of these kinds of questions about formal training versus, you know, the, the ever popular self-taught, you know, what's, what course of action brought you here? Um, well, a, a lot. I, I started out, as I said, I started out in, in high school taking, or I'm sorry, um, middle school taking uh, a photography class there. I don't feel like I learned a lot in that class, um, you know. College classes certainly taught me a little bit more, and I ended up working in the dark room and learning a whole lot there. Um, but really, the the basics of photography, in terms of um, I, I should say, going beyond the basics of photography, beyond shutter speed and aperture and and ISO. Once you get into field work, being in the field is absolutely invaluable. And if you have someone who uh, is a little more advanced than you are, or who is at least as curious as you are, and as interested in the challenge of finding the right light, getting the right photo, um, it, it really makes a difference. Jay and I have learned so much from each, each other over the, over the last five or six, five or six years, years that, that I, I mean, it, I mean, it's it, it's something you can't even count. It's it's incredible to have someone else to work with. And that doesn't mean it has to be somebody you end up mirroring. You know, right. if, if you have a friend or you have um, people online, that's huge. You know, listen to people's critiques, hear what they have to say. I cannot begin to, to uh, enumerate the value of having people tell you what they think of your work. But honestly, not just, wow, you're amazing, you're so good. If they can say to you, you know, your work is nice and all, but this photo, yeah, you know, kind of questionable. <laughs> but then if they can go beyond that and tell you why, what it is about the photo that isn't quite singing to them, you know, then you can learn from that. And you have to be willing to listen. You have to get past that feeling of, oh, God, they don't like it, you know, to, to be able to learn from it. And, and I really think learning from, from critiques and from other people is huge. I've learned more from other people than I ever learned in a classroom. Which is not to say that, say that classroom work isn't, isn't important. important. It is, but experience, experience is, is, is invaluable. The, the, other thing awesome. we, um, the other thing we look about photography business is um, if somebody was to ask me today, I want to become a landscape photographer. Should I go to school for photography? I would say no, don't. Don't waste your time going to school for photography. Because photography is, is, is art, and art defines you personally. Of course you can learn technical side of photography, uh, inner school, out of school. But what is more important in su succeeding about business of photography is to know about how to do business. And, and I would have to say, don't listen to Jay. <laughs> I'm just no, I mean, I, I do think that um, he's right in a way. I, th I, think I think going to school for art is perfectly and 100% OK. But I also think that you need to be aware there's so much more that you need to learn if you want to turn art into a business. You need to understand business administration. You need to understand marketing, which is huge. You need to understand computers and, and your camera, camera and all, and all those things. things. And, and a lot of times, a lot of times I'll, I'll recommend to people that they, that they major in something, something uh, or double major, I should say, and, and maybe have a, a major in art and a double major in business administration or in uh, information technology. My degree is actually in information technology and having that knowledge of computers, that background in programming and, and that understanding of computers has, has been amazing for me because it means that I can run my own business, which is, which is something maybe I couldn't do without that information. That actually leads into another question that um, I get a lot is people want to go, they get, they get a DSLR and they love it, they, they're passionate about it and now they want to do it as a business or they want to do it as a side, you know, career 
to supplement their income, that kind of thing. And sometimes I actually discourage them because you know you can still do it as your passion without having to make money from it. But let's say somebody does want to go and pursue it as a career or even part time. What kind of advice would you give to them, especially if they want to go into landscape and nature photography? Well, the first thing that they need to know as a landscape or nature photography business is what they're trying to sell. Um, most people, when you say, I want to become a photographer, they, they want to make money, but they don't know what they're trying to sell to the audience. Uh, so the first step, I would say that if you want to go to the landscape photography, you need to find out how you're going to make your money. And based on how you make your money, will define what next steps to follow. So I'll give you an example. Um, if you want to sell fine art prints, then you need to know the audience you're selling to. And the photograph you take and the business model you set up as a fine art photographer is going to be very different than a business model like ours, uh, Worry Nine Mind, which is more education based. And the photographs you, you take, the websites and the businesses you interact with and the consumers you interact with will be a very different ball game at that point in time. So, so the first thing I want to tell people who want to go in the business is find out how you want to make money. And I think I would take that a little further, not just think about how you want to make money, but think about your target market. It, it's so important to know who you're trying to sell your work to. Jay touched on that for a second, but um, for example, our target market is not um, uh, people who want to buy prints. We're not, we're not looking for museums or, or uh, private collectors. Our target market is other photographers, and for the most part, other photographers are not particularly interested in buying prints, sometimes, but not very often. Mostly what they're looking for is knowledge, and so we actually sell ebooks and, and things like that rather than, and you know, classes and, and workshops, rather than focusing our attention on selling prints. Um, we actually make very little effort to sell our prints, although maybe we need to do that a little bit more, but it, it's something that, that's not where our target is. We know our target market very, very well, and we reach out to that audience as much as possible in order to maximize our sales. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Do you guys do any any stock work, like sell any of your work at stock agencies? Um, yeah, I actually work with um, maybe nine stock agencies at this point. Um, for a while it was more than that. A lot of them are, are sort of consolidating and so I don't know exactly how many com companies I'm working with now. But um, stock photography is actually a really great place to start out. Um, it's how I got my foot in the door. Uh, I started doing stock photography in, in maybe 2004 and um, I, um, as I said, I work with a whole slew of, of agencies. They sell my work and I get royalty checks for it. And, and that, um, not only did it make it easy for people to see my work and uh, you know it, it got me a, a foot in the door with uh, the Marriott hotel chain uh, a friend of mine saw the photos he passed it on to a friend of his and he happened to work for Marriott and they called and said hey we need somebody to shoot interiors and so that's how I got my foot in the door I started getting paid and I could say at that point that I was a professional photographer because I was making fun making money you know <laughs> and so of course I don't work for Marriott now and I, I um, don't work for any corporation because I, I learned my lesson. But um, um, you know, it's it, it's a way to get started. It's a way to start the money coming in. And once you uh, get your foot in the door, then you can really um, push off from there. Is there one particular agency that you would recommend to start with, uh, as opposed to you know trying to get your foot into Getty off the get go? Um, a lot of times we recommend the micro stock agencies um, and a lot of people will give us uh, trouble for that but the fact is the micro stock agencies are very good um, they have huge collections it it can be tough to get started but it's easier to get in with a micro stock agency than it is with the big agencies like Getty and Getty actually owns a lot of the micro stock agency and once they start to notice you they might just drop you a line and say, hey, we want your portfolio. And that, that's what happened with us. And so, um, yeah, I, I highly recommend sites like uh, Shutterstock and um, Big Stock. Um, what else is there? Um, iStock. iStock is oh, yeah, actually, iStock. iStock is a great one. Um, so there, there are a bunch of them, and, and they're very easy to find. And then once, once you sort of have your foot in the door, 
again, getting your foot in the door is huge in the photography business. It's, it's not an easy thing I to do. I can warn you guys that but landscape photography is not a big genre or a big seller in microstock agencies. You can put your photos up, you will make some money. But uh, there are other genres out there in the microstock agency that sell a lot more than just landscape photography. It's a great way to learn, though. If you're shooting for microstock agencies, you're, you're going to be wanting to um, look at conceptual photography and, and food. Uh, food photography, things like that. But you can also take it into your love of nature. Take a nature photography scene. Take a look at the one on JJ's screen, screen, screen right, right here. here. Put, a put a person in that, in that scene, and all, and all of a sudden, the stock agencies will want it. Um, so it, 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 it changes depending on what you want to photograph. If you're out there and you want to take this photograph, Go ahead and take that photograph, save it for your fine art portfolio, but also keep in mind that putting a person in there will make it something that the stock agencies want as well. So again, so the, the bottom line comes down to is well, what are you trying to sell and who you're trying to sell to? Makes a lot of sense. So I'd like to see some of your favorite pictures that you guys have taken. You must have some you know, or and I imagine they change from time to time as you photograph new things. But what are some of your current favorites for each of you, and what's the story behind them? All right, I will let Marina go first on this one. I'm going to make you mute your microphone because I know we're getting some feedback from it. Um, so, I think this photo that's on the screen now is one of my favorites right now. Um, I am doing a lot more uh, minimalist photography lately, so my, my photography is is much more simple than it used to be. My colors tend to be very, very simple. I'm always looking for um, monochromatic uh, color combinations like the one you see on the screen here or, or analogous color schemes. Um, I love the simplicity of the piece. This is a shot I took in Iceland um, last year or the year before? year before. Um, yeah. um, and uh, this is a beach where I mean it's just beautiful. The whole beach is strewn with these gorgeous icebergs and uh, we had we had kind of a nasty accident on this beach. Both of us had nasty accidents on this beach. Um, Jay was uh, knocked under by by a rogue wave and 20 minutes maybe half an hour later I was uh, well I was attacked by icebergs so <laughs> I was on the beach. A, a triple rogue wave came in, pushed all the beautiful icebergs very slowly and calmly up and past me and behind me and I turned around and all three waves reversed at the same time. The momentum that had built up from those waves was incredible. It was like being hit by a car. And so I was hit once in my knee, it took me down and it was a nightmare. <laughs> I was very badly hurt. Uh, and yet, I look at this photo and I don't see that. I don't see the pain that these, these horrible things cause. Um, instead, you know, I just I look at it and to me this is the essence of nature, the absolute beauty of it and yet the power in nature is what attracts me every time. The absolute peace and serenity that I feel which is juxtap juxtaposed if you will next to the, the incredible power that's, that's hiding in, in it and um, you know I, I, it took months for me to heal, six, eight months to be fully healed. Um, but I'm fine now. <laughs> so, and I still love the photo and I can't wait to get back this summer. <laughs> Were you up to your knees in the water taking this shot? No, actually. I at The water, when I... Um, for this shot, it was not even coming up to my, my ankles. Um, the, the photo, uh, the icebergs that actually hit me, I stood there for an hour, uh, for half an hour and the water never came up past my ankles until the rogue waves came in. The first wave came up maybe to my knees, the second wave came up a little higher and the third wave was up past my waist. Um, and I, I think people don't understand that a perfectly calm, beautiful ocean at, at one moment can be just that and at the next moment it can take you down. It's not a joke. The power in those waves is beyond anything you could understand just looking at a photo like this. They're, they're I think amazing. people who have survived tsunamis will understand that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it seems to come out of nowhere. And, and because the three waves compounded one another, um, because one came in but didn't reverse at all, you know, normally when a wave reverses, it takes some of the power from the next wave coming in. And that didn't happen. All three waves came in and they reversed as one. And so the power was really extreme. Well, I'm glad you're okay. 
Me too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Jay, do you have a, a favorite image of yours? Well, um, I have plenty of them, but um, let me see if I can show you one that uh, that is more memorable. So here's the one that you see on your screen that's coming up now. And um, no icebergs here. This is in the middle of the <laughs> desert. But um, if you notice the photograph, it looks like there's a volcano in the distance. Um, it, yeah. It's not quite a volcano. What it is is um, behind me there's a sliver of light just uh, through an opening, just like very similar to the one over here I'm pointing to. And uh, it was a heavy overcast day and a storm was coming in. So what happened valley. was that uh, yeah. the storm was uh, blowing very high winds. It was like um, 35, 40 miles an hour wind. And if you look at the photo, and I, I'm going to do it whether it messes it up or not. Um, when you look at the photo, you can actually see this, the sand being um, um, flown from uh, my left to right. And the sand was so powerful that when I stood there, it felt like somebody was shaving my face. I could still feel the sand shaving oh. my face. So I had to stand out there for about an hour and a half or so for the sun to go down, hoping something would happen. And then all of a sudden I saw the light. I ran up to the dunes. I didn't have a chance to take out my filter. I was too afraid to open my bag. And uh, I took several shots. Uh, I have a couple of them. This is one of my favorite. I have a vertical composition that looks pretty great too. And then I had to hike back in the same sandstorm about a mile and a half back to my car. And I stopped every few, few hundred feet uh, to take photographs. By the time I got back, there was like sand everywhere in my hair, my ears, in my nose, my lungs. It was, um, it was an incredible experience, but it's probably one of my favorite photographs. I was going to say, because I've been to Death Valley, and I think I've been to those same sand dunes, and you do have to go quite a ways out to sort of get past the tourist people that are wandering around the closer ones. Is that sort of what your goal That's was? That's true, but there was nobody here. In fact, the, the sand was blowing so hard um, that uh, every two steps I took, the, the wind was so hard that my footprints were completely erased. Now, do you use um do you use a filter on the front of your lens? Like I know there's a debate between some people use them, some don't. Do you use a UV filter? And in that case, you kind of wanted one, I think. Uh, yeah, I always have a UV filter. Uh, all our cameras have a protective UV filter. All lenses, actually, I should say, have protective UV filters. It, it's funny that you give that example because I tell my students I use them as well, and I tell them that you know one of the reasons you might have need for one is is if you're in a sandstorm your lens gets sandblasted literally so your filter is much cheaper to replace than your front element of your lens that's right we we always find that you know it's it's better to just take care of the lens it's too easy to scratch a lens people will say yeah but if you drop it maybe it'll actually cause more damage to your lens the fact is i really hope you're not dropping your lens um, you know, if, if you drop your lens, you've just dropped your lens, period. The filter, not the filter, it, it doesn't matter at that point. What's more likely to happen is that you're going to bump up against something, um, you know, scratch it on something, or deal, have to deal with a sandstorm, or, for example, uh, the spray from the ocean, which can actually cause damage to your lens if, if you try and, you know, rub that off with, a, with a, um, a lens cloth or something. So, yeah, but I think you'll notice... I mean, both Jay and I, when we choose a photo that we really love, most of the time it's really the experience um, behind the photo that, that hits us. And that's not something you can see when you look at our photo, right? And, and so we have to try, we're always trying to convey a sense of something with our photographs. We're not necessarily trying to share our experience with you because it's something we can't always do. What we're trying to do is convey something. With my photo of the iceberg, I'm trying to convey a, a very clear sense of peace, right? And, and that and, clearly comes across. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> glad that worked. <laughs> you know, and, and mine's all about excitement. Right. Right. Excitement is less. more about the the power, power and the uh, you know the, the light dynamic. The <laughs> right. So he's all about the drama. Yep. Definitely. Okay, okay. So the drama king and the and the peaceful queen. Okay. Very nice. I have some new nicknames for you. So um you guys obviously travel a fair bit, yes? Yes. So yes, is there is there some places that 
you know, you tend to return to again and again, or, you know, if, if somebody said to you, okay, you can only go to one place ever again, where, oh. where would you need to go? You know, I'd have to go cry in a hole. <laughs> I don't think I could handle that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, where would we go if we could only go one place? Oof. Well, I tell you what, we've been to Utah probably, what, 15 times in the past few years? I, I, I will answer this question very oh, easily. I'll take it over. Where the light is right. Yeah. To, to me, the location matters little. And I, I, can, I have my favorite locations and I like to shoot locations. But I like to shoot light first. So if, if the light is perfect in my backyard, I'll probably stay in my backyard and forego that trip to Wyoming with a very bland or dull lighting. I'm going to Wyoming. <laughs> you can stay here in the backyard. <laughs> I'll find the good light in Wyoming while he stays here and photographs the good light in our backyard. Okay. Okay. Is there some place on the other side of the coin that you haven't been that you're intrigued to go see and watch? There are so many places. Jay's been to Africa, Africa, but uh, that's, that's some place I would love to go. There, there she is. She's back. We, we kept, kept it going. going. <laughs> oh, good. good. The internet doesn't like me. Um, there will be Japan, New Zealand, Antarctica, Norway, Norway Patagonia, 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 Chile. Chile. We, could we could go on, on. Yes. Yes. Antarctica. Maldives. <laughs> so lots of places. Yes. Yes, Just stay Antarctica tuned and follow is... our blog and you'll see all those places. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Antarctica is on my list of where I want to go as well. Yeah, yeah. definitely. That, it, it, a friend of mine just went there very recently and uh, I, I could not contain my jealousy. <laughs> you and me both. Well, maybe we'll meet up there. That so, would be um, can you guys sort of walk me through some of your images in terms of how much of your images are what you see is what you came what came out of the camera and how much is post processing because a lot of beginners uh, you know that are doing a lot of post processing or any um, sort of have a hesitation and and they think okay I don't want to spend hours doing this to my photos I just want nice photos but walk me through how much you guys are doing and how important is it on the final product so uh, I'm going to start and then Jay's going to move into um, showing some processing and I just want to say first of all that you know we get a lot of people who say well how much do you manipulate your photos how much work do you do in Photoshop and I, I want to point out first of all that manipulation happens first in the field um, <laughs> which, which I think is critical to see I like her um, which is critical to photography if you take a look at that iceberg photo um, and I'm gonna have Jay pull it up for a second there this isn't how the scene looked at all but I didn't do this in Photoshop I did it in the field um, the the water was moving, there was a lot of texture in the water. I used a very long shutter speed in order to manipulate this photograph. I used a long shutter speed, probably about 30 seconds, it was getting dark at that point, and uh, I wanted to blur out the water. It was very important to me to remove every distraction that I could remove. And the, the, uh, the details in the water were part of that, and so um, and that's just a very basic example, but I really like to point out, I think it's important to point out that um, photography is about whatever tools you use to create a finished product. And in this case, this was mostly done in camera. Now, of course, I chose my color balance later in, in uh, uh, Adobe Camera Raw, and in that case, I chose a blue that matched the mood I was looking for. This was a very blue scene. The, the sky was very blue. The icebergs had a blue glow to them. The water was blue. Um, and the, the blue from the storm that was sort of coming in, in, in the sky was really intense. But still, my color choice is very important. If I had shifted this a little bit towards gold, it would, it would lose so much, at least in my mind. But I'm the artist, so I get to decide, right? <laughs> so. So that's the point I want to make, and then Jay can move in, and he's going to show you how. Go ahead, Jay. He's going to show you how he takes a photo um, out of the camera and what he does to it um, in Camera Raw, and then in in Photoshop too, right? Um, a little no, bit. Just, oh, just, just in Camera Raw. Raw. Most yeah. of our photos actually, we do almost all our processing in in Camera Raw. So we'll go from. I'll let him go from there. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Lightroom girl myself, and I probably do, yeah, 90% of my and, processing. And uh, Bridge and um, Adobe Camera Raw can actually do everything that Lightroom can do, 
and more. And so that that's part of the reason we use it. I, I've been using Bridge for, I, I think, since 1994. So it's been a very long, or not Bridge, but uh, Photoshop since 1994. And Bridge is an excellent program. But I have nothing against Lightroom, neither Jay or I have anything against it. We often recommend it to our new students because it's easy to use and easy to get used to. Well, you have something against Lightroom. I don't. No, I don't. I really don't. It's just <laughs> not what I use. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I, uh, so one of the things that we I have to point out to the people is um, we use workflow in as efficient manner as possible. So if I can do most of my work in Adobe Camera Raw, I'll do it. If not, I'll go to Light um, to Adobe Photoshop in an instant. But whatever work we do and wherever we do it, we have a clear idea of what we want to do. We will not play around with the sliders. There is almost very rare cases where we will try different settings on a slider. That's not how we approach. What our first approach to an image, any image, would be to analyze the image. And then, based on that analysis, make targeted adjustments. Okay? So, and this is an informal process. We don't mean to suggest that we go through a checklist and we're really rigid about it. We'll look at a photo and we'll say, well, it needs this and it needs that and it needs that and we'll go from there. So <laughs> it's not like we're, we're uh, rigid about it. So I think that um, the analysis of the, the image is actually incredibly important for us because it prevents us from uh, making random adjustments and focuses our efforts on very targeted adjustments. So if you look at the analysis of an image like this, first thing we'll notice is our color temperature. Our color temperature is way off balance over here. The scene was taken in a cloudy setting um, on a fairly heavy overcast day right after the rains. So we'll adjust the color temperature. Um, because it was very cloudy and overcast, it was also, um, the contrast was very low. So you can see the entire dynamic range is constrained and majority mm -hmm. of the pixels are located in uh, the lower half of the dynamic range. So we'll adjust the contrast. And based on the, those two parameters, you will see that majority of our adjustments are just targeted at that. So what we'll do is we will set off and start off with a cloudy balance. And as soon as I do that, you can notice that a lot of things quite clear up. There was a blue cast to these um, trunks which disappeared and I'll flip it back on and off and you'll be able to see that when I turn the preview off it will go to the blue cast and when I set the preview on the blue cast will disappear and the natural color is restored so once from once from cloudy if I feel that the cloudy is too much I will move it slightly up or down from the cloudy balance to adjust the color balance now that the color balance is done, my next step would be to do the contrast adjustment. So as I said, the contrast was a little bit low, so I did the contrast adjustment. After that, I will look at the histogram and say, hey, the histogram looks like it is skewed on a dark side slightly. So what I will do is I will change the exposure to maybe a third of a stop higher or so. Okay, And I'll keep an eye on the histogram. I don't want to go over here because then you can see all the reds appearing. So I will keep an eye on the histogram and adjust my exposure so that my histogram is touching almost to the left side. The right side. Sorry, to the right <laughs> side. Now, it, you, can, you notice that what happened was that dull photograph that you saw with a blue cast all of a sudden became a pretty intense, colorful photograph of spring scene. And all I have to do is People always say, hey, how come your photos are so colorful? Well, our secret to colorful photographs is not to crank up the color saturation over here that you see, but to be able to just leave the color saturation to be between 0 and 10%. Verena leaves her color saturation between 0 and 5% majority of the time, and adjust the rest of the parameters so that the photograph comes out in a true color that you actually saw when you were present. Now, once this is done, if I have to do anything else, I will either open up in Photoshop and do all my other adjustments in Photoshop. The only other thing I would do to this particular photo is perhaps 
crop this little distracting element at the bottom up here. And I'll just crop it. That's it. That would be my processing for this. And of course, you can do, you do your pro uh, your cropping in the Adobe Camera Raw too. So that's something you don't have to do here. Right. And do you guys do any um, filtration? Like you mentioned, getting it in camera. And I know a lot of landscape photographers use the you know the drop in gradated filters and things like that. Do you use those in field, or you tend to do more of your edge darkening and things like that in computer? We we do both. We have a set of filters that we carry in the field, and whenever the conditions present themselves, we will actually take a photo that will come out perfectly in the camera. Uh, if we can do that in the field, we would prefer to do that in the field because that will save us a lot of processing time. However, we are proficient enough, and we offer our own um, set of blending techniques to make the photographs look natural. Um, so in majority of the photographs that you see on my scene, you will not be able to tell whether they are blended or they came out straight out of the camera. We will, we will um, we'll use those filters if, if they're effective in the field and if we have time to use them. Uh, most of the time we do use them when we have a broad range of light that we're working with. But there are times where the range of light is so broad that the filters aren't going to help. They, they're, they're a start, but they certainly aren't enough. And in those cases, uh, we'll bracket and then blend the exposures using the, the process Jay was talking about. Um, in, in Photoshop. Right, or a lot of times the problem with a gradated filter is that the gradation is straight and you're not always dealing with the horizon. You might have a mountain or a tree or something that right. you're going to darken the top of and then right. it doesn't look right. Right, exactly. Here's a photo of Jay's that uh, shows exactly that problem. If we use a graduated neutral density filter for that shot, uh, the top of the tree is going to be very, very dark. Um, and it, it, it's just not a very appealing look. Right, so in this case, he would um, bracket the shot, blend the three images, and uh, do it that way. Of course, then you have to deal with the fact that there's probably some wind and some motion of the leaves, and and uh, so it gets complicated. But uh, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> the challenge is we, we were talking earlier about how you teach. Now you call it IHDR, intelligent HDR. Can you, That's right. without explaining the whole process, can you give me a thirty-second? sort of a description because I do sort of the you know more traditional fo tone mapping HDR and um, some image blending but you guys are doing more masking correct? Aha. Uh -huh. Oh I can't hear you again Jane. So here it is I'll show you one. So here are the three bracketed okay. shots that I took okay. um, and I'll show you three bracketed shots. So this is the first shot which is a base shot Here's one for the foreground, and here's one for the sky. And what we do is we actually put masks um, based on a proprietary technique that we have developed and we teach. And those two masks will enable us to bring out all the details in all parts of the images. And in order for you to see what the mask looks like, I'll turn on one of the masks. So here is one of the masks. Part of the mask, as you can see, is blurred out other parts have very sharp edges. So what we do is we actually define and create this mask in Photoshop. And once that is done, then essentially all you have to do is just adjust slight contrast and you're done. The whole process you know, so takes us mostly if about... If somebody wants to learn this technique from you, do you teach this as a live workshop or is that this like um, an online class, or how, do, how can they learn this from you? Um, we actually have a, a series of webinar recordings. We used to teach it live, um, but we found that since we were just repeating the same information over and over again, it made more sense for us to just, just record it. Um, so we recorded it. We now sell it in four parts um, so that people can um, choose what they need. Um, you know, when we were doing this live, people had to sign up for the whole thing. Um, and, it, and it became expensive. So what we've done is we've broken it up into four parts. You can, um, if, if you need it, you can do the first section, which is uh, equipment and uh, nature photography in the field and, and stuff like that. And then we move on and we go through uh, layers and masks. We go all the way into the, the finer points of, um, of, blending. of blending, thank you, getting through, through the very fine details of getting these masks uh, refined. And then... Uh, 
Um, so you can buy them individually, or you can start with one and then and move on to the next one if you feel you're ready for it. Just check our website. Yep, it's all on our website. There are IHDR webinar recordings. I'll provide some links to your site and to the products for anybody that's that's watching um, the video on my website can check it out. Thank you. And you also have some other things you do. Uh, you have some ebooks. I know I've downloaded several of your um, your picture ebooks, and I've been flipping through those. And you've also got workshops, correct? Like um, you take people and you lead them in a workshop in a certain location. Is that how does that work? Um, yeah, we we teach workshops rarely now. Um, we were uh, actually in Nicaragua just last week, and that was a really neat workshop. Um, but and that was with the Giving Lens and Empowerment International, which are some amazing um, groups. So that's Colby. Yes, Colby Brown does uh, the Giving Lens, and uh, Kathy Adams is in charge of uh, Empowerment International. Um, so we worked with them, and we worked with kids in the barrios down there in the uh, in the slums of Granada. Uh, wow. Quite an experience. It was amazing. Um, but um, we also, as you mentioned, we have eBooks, and we have I don't even know how many, 15, 20. 18. 18. There you go. 18 ebooks right now. Um, some of them are free, and you can just download those directly from our website. And some um, you have to pay for. But uh, um, we try and put as much information in in into them as possible. So we also have a very active blog, um, which um, puts out a post every day, um, every weekday. And we also own two largest um, communities on Google Plus. The landscape photographer community, which is over 85,000 members or so, and wow. the photo tips community, which has I think around 22, 25,000 members. And you moderate both of those, or your your members? We are the owners of both the communities uh, jointly, and we have a group of moderators who are absolutely the most fantastic moderators in the world. They are so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what that means uh, is they do all the hard stuff, right? And you guys they well, do they a lot of work. They do and we provide them. the vision and the guidance to lead the community and to be able to make sure the community remains active. So um, we have like several thousand posts on both communities and they keep continuously growing. We also do um our vision also includes things like being able to make the communities more interactive. Um, within within the Google Plus uh, community page. So we provide things like contests, question of the day. We'll provide interviews for people, um, learning places to learn from each other. The, the photo tips community um, actually has its own page now where we take the best tips that people provide and we post them there. And that's really worth looking at um, if you're trying to learn because the wealth of information that shows up on not only in the community itself, but also on our photo tips page. It's just mind blowing what people are sharing now. And, and that's what I love about Google Plus. It's really pushed people to uh, open up and share and, and you know, get to know people. And, and that's huge for photography. It means so much to be able to learn from people who know what they're talking about. Well, that's actually how I saw your guys' work the first time. I think somebody else had shared something of one of your images, and that's how I saw your work. and started following you guys and um, I'm, I'm really happy that uh, we're able to talk today. Thank you. We yeah. are happy that we got to talk to you too. Thanks for having us. Thank you. <laughs> Where can people find you on, on the internet and um, if they want to connect with you? I'll, I'll get links from you for some of the communities if people want to join in. Uh, it's very easy. Um, just type our names in any search engine and we'll be the first links to come up. Um, the the best place to start though is our website. Our website is the central location. So jpatelphotography.com is mine. And mine is uh, www.photographybyvarina.com. And I'll give the people links to those you guys well. one day on a trip and maybe we can uh, plan a trip to Antarctica and meet, meet down south. Yeah, we'll see All if we right. can catch some penguins to photograph. <laughs> Sounds Thanks good. Thanks very much, and uh, I'll see you on Google Plus. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.